Welcome everybody. My name is Winifred Sullivan. I'm the chair of the Indiana University Department of Religious Studies. Um, welcome to alumni, students, former faculty, current faculty, and friends to the ongoing celebration of the 50th anniversary of the founding of the IU Department. We are really delighted that you are here. So today and tomorrow we are celebrating with several events including this afternoon's lecture, which you're about to hear, by our first doctoral graduate, Jason Badoon, Professor of Religious Studies at Northern Arizona University, and a distinguished specialist in the religions of the ancient world. Current faculty and students met with Professor Dune, with Badoon this afternoon to discuss his work, and tomorrow alumni will meet with current students and faculty to consult about the present and future plans of the department. But tonight, after the lecture, we will party. <laughs> so please first stay now and hear Professor Badoon, but please stay after for a reception. And I will speak briefly at the reception about the history of the department and its glorious present as well. <laughs> so for now, Professor Haberman will introduce Jason. Good evening. I'd also like to add my voice to uh, Winnie's welcome. Welcoming you all to uh, this particular event, the celebration of the 50th year uh, anniversary or birthday party, I like to think of it, of the department. Um, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces that I've not seen for years now. And uh, I'm delighted to be part of this event. I am particularly pleased and honored to be introducing you to this evening's speaker, Professor Jason Medu. Um, I was at the gathering earlier in the day when a group of faculty and graduate students met with Professor Medu to discuss a paper he had written, and I was just struck by the fact that he seems to me to be the perfect product of the Department of uh, Religious Studies at Indiana University meaning specifically that uh, I was just impressed by his ability to showcase uh, those grand religious studies issues while working with very particular data. And in his case, the range of data he's working with is, is very, very impressive. And I think that really, for me, is the mark of the approach to religious studies at Indiana University. I think I am the uh, only ragtag remnant of the active faculty in the Department of Religious Studies that was present when Sam Preuss, one of our professors at that time, uh, hooded Jason at uh, the grand celebration of the occasion of putting our very first PhD student in the department back in 1995. In addition to myself, there was also two emeritus faculty. There were a number of emeritus faculty, but I see the two of them are here. Uh, Jim Ackerman and Steve Stein were also present for that event. It was a grand celebration. I, I, I think I remember that the uh, entire faculty was present uh, because it was the first occasion uh, that we were celebrating at that time of putting anyone with a, a PhD in, in the department. So a grand celebration for the department that had admitted its very first group of PhD students back in 1989. And it was also just a grand celebration of Jason himself. And boy has he done us proud uh, ever since that day. Jason came to Indiana University in 1989 after earning a master's degree from Harvard University. After re receiving his PhD from our department in 1995 and teaching for a while at IU, as you see in this photo here, he landed in 1998 a tenure track position in comparative studies, or I think the department used to be called uh, Humanities, Art, and Religion at that time, at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. And he has been there ever since, uh, in part because he tells me he's been seduced by the natural beauty of that place, and this is hard to imagine leaving it. He went on 
uh, to become chair of the department in the year 2000 and was promoted to the rank of full professor in 2009. One entry I particularly enjoyed on his CV occurs in a list of his uh, that identifies Jason's areas of expertise, which included in this list, uh, quote, ancient Christianities. And my computer immediately marked that in red that that was a misspelling. But as we will see shortly, Jason is certainly not one, or is one who understands that within the singular rubric Christianity, there are great multiplicities. He's also identified on his department's website as an expert in the fields of biblical studies, Manichaeism, religions of late antique West Africa, and the theory and method in the contemporary study of religions. Jason's impressive list of publications is much too long to present to you now, but let me highlight a few of its major points. In the year 2000, he published with John Hopkins University Press a much cited and much celebrated book titled The Manichaean Body, Discipline, and Ritual that was a reworked version of his IE dissertation. And as I understand it, this was the book that uh, marked him as the man in Manichaean studies. The following year, this book won the American Academy of Religion's Best First Book Award in uh, the history of religions, uh, which is quite an achievement. Since then, his productivity has continued at an enviable pace. He published uh, four more single authored works in 2003, Truth in Translation, Accuracy and Bias in English Translations of the New Testament, 2010, Augustine's Manichaean Dilemma 1, which is really part of a trilogy, Conversion and Apostasy, uh, 2013, Augustine's Manichaean Dilemma 2, Making a Catholic Self, and the third one is in process. In 2003, he published the first New Testament. In addition to these publications, he has published four edited volumes on Manichaeanism and a multiple author book that has just recently appeared under the title Manny at the Court of the Persian Kings. In addition to this, he has published 10 refereed journal articles and 21 book chapters. I'll spare you the reading mm -hmm. uh, of your title. Jason has been also awarded many prominent research fellowships and grants over the years including numerous NEH grants and the prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship in 2004. Uh, as I say, he does us proud. I know that you're eager to hear Jason speak this evening, so let me stop there. The title of his talk this evening is The Secret History of Early Christianity. Please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Jason Badoon back to the meeting. Introduction and it's a, it is a great homecoming for me as this, this picture shows. Um, it's also a, a homecoming for my lovely and brilliant wife, Jujana Gulachi, who I met while I was here as a graduate student, so I owe I you a lot more than just my PhD. I, uh, I took the invitation to speak today in celebration of 20 years since graduating as a kind of uh, Yes, what have you done lately, challenge. But what I have been doing is a bit here and a bit there, but much larger development of a field, the history of early Christianity, which belongs to the period known as late antiquity. So I want to provide you today with a highly selective survey of the first 400 years of that history, touching here and there on my own efforts to contribute to a better understanding of it, in order to suggest to you that we are only at the beginning of unraveling its many unknowns. And perhaps I might provoke you into taking a fresh look at a subject that some have naively considered all sewn up neatly. Let me start then with the fundamental obstacle we face in recovering an accurate picture of early Christianity. Alistair McIntyre opens his classic study of ethics entitled After Virtue with what he calls a disquieting suggestion. Imagine 
that the natural sciences were to suffer the effects of a catastrophe, he writes, going on to describe a series of events that leads to a social revolution that effectively wipes out science as a living practice. Later still, there is a reaction against this destructive movement, he continues, and enlightened people seek to revive science, although they have largely forgotten what it was. All they possess are fragments. Nonetheless, all these fragments are re-embodied in the set of practices which go under the revived names of physics, chemistry, and biology. Nobody, or almost nobody, realizes that what they are doing is not natural science in any proper sense at all, for everything that they do and say conforms to certain canons of consistency and coherence, and those contexts which would be needed to make sense of what they are doing have been lost. McIntyre goes on to argue that something much like that has occurred in the field of ethics. And I stand before you today to suggest that something much like that has occurred in the history of Christianity. Very dramatic historical changes and socio-cultural revolutions, starting at the end of late antiquity and recurring in medieval and early modern times, have wiped out an accurate memory of Christian origins and what being Christian meant in its earliest period. By a secret history, therefore, I do not mean something resulting from conspirational or deliberate concealment, but rather the loss of historical memory as a result of quite natural historical processes that overwrite earlier history with the perspectives of later eras, layer upon layer, until the original history as it happened lies deeply buried under later assumptions and constructs. Modern research has recovered isolated bits of that history, but lacks much of the connective tissue to hold it together into a larger picture true to actual historical conditions and developments. Instead, those fragments have been largely fitted into an existing traditional normative model of Christian origins that serves to make what Christianity later became appear sensible and inevitable. Advances in our knowledge of early Christian history made in the last two centuries, of which there have been have been shoehorned into a framework inherited from normative triumphant orthodoxy, which has continued to control how we prioritize our sources and draw connections between them. But in recent decades, we have seen the inherited paradigm fragment under a series of new historical insights that challenge it to its very foundation. Dissemination and acceptance of these new insights is slow, however, slowly working their way from very specialized groups of researchers to the larger community of historians of Christianity, and on into the field of religious studies as a whole, and from there coming to be known by the wider public. So it's not a lost history, but a secret one, because we have been successfully recovering it, sometimes from evidence hidden in plain sight, such as the all too familiar texts of the Bible. And various constituencies know some of it, while others don't. Some of these newly recovered bits of history are known to most academics in religious studies, but not to the general public. Some are known to specialists in early Christian history, but not to their religious studies colleagues outside of that specialty. Some are known to the leading edge of these specialists, but still not received by the upholders of the old paradigm among them. So some of the things I say tonight will be familiar to some of you. Some will sound like you maybe heard them a little bit. Some might be totally new to you. And I hope among that variety of things I have to say, I'll interest all of you to one degree or another. So ironically, many of the fragments of the secret history of earliest Christianity have been hiding in plain sight, in the books that Christians read every day. But since all reading is selective, their significance has been overshadowed by surrounding text that is coded by modern Christianity as most important. This was the point I tried to make in my book, Truth and Translation, written for the general public, which takes as its theme how later Christian positions are imposed on the biblical text through the seemingly innocent practice of translation. Through a number of examples, I showed that the translators commonly read their own modern Christian doctrine into the Greek passages they are translating, not necessarily intentionally, but because they are conditioned by their own sense of what the Bible must say, because it is what Christianity today. This was a popularly aimed exercise meant to illustrate something I had examined at a theoretical level in an article published in the journal Method and Theory in the Study of Religion, titled The Historical Assessment of Speech Acts. It may sound as obvious to you as it was to me that a text, as a purposive communication, 
has a historically situated and limited range of possible meaning. And so we can get closer to what an author may have meant by considering the limits of what he or she could have meant in a particular time and place and as a participant in certain learned conventions of communicating. But I suppose what was taken as provocative in my piece was my insistence that these same rules of interpretation apply to religious texts, including biblical texts, which could not mean for their authors what they mean for modern Christians, because the frame of reference for the terminology was different then. In my more recent book, The First New Testament, I've tried to put my money where my mouth is and provide a translation that tries to remain within these limits and brings the reader closer to the sense of the texts in their original first century context. But I'll come back to that book a little later. Yet to recover the story of Christian origins, we need to go back beyond the New Testament texts to the communities whose memories and ideas were already being refashioned according to the agendas of later Christian authors. There has been a growing realization in the last half century, spreading from specialists out into the general public, about just how important Jesus' Jewish context is to understanding his motives and message. Many centuries of thinking of Jesus as the founder of a completely different religion, Christianity, must be overturned by the realization that Jesus undoubtedly saw himself working within the Jewish cultural tradition into which he had been born, and carrying forward certain prophetic and apocalyptic trends within that tradition. And let me stress, carrying those trends forward not to negate Judaism, but to contest the meaningful core of Judaism with other options held among his Jewish peers. He had no idea of founding a new religion, and we can be sure of this in part because there simply was no concept of a new religion in the ancient world. What I mean is that there was no idea that a religion could stand apart from a particular ethnicity for which the religion was simply an element of its culture. One learned one's religion alongside of learning one's language, diet, manner of dress, social relationships, and means of livelihood. Judaism, that is, Judaismos, was a cultural re-identification and reaffirmation of Jewish culture, including religious culture, in the face of an aggressive Hellenistic cultural colonialism. Yes, one could become a proselyte, could become a Hellene or a Jew, but that meant assimilation into a population in all respects not just selectively in its religious practices. Now, in the course of a few minutes, I've identified for you something that is still a bit of a secret, Jesus' Jewishness, and something that is still a major secret, the absence of religions as entities distinct from ethnicity and culture in the ancient world. Everyone in religious studies and many people in the general public understand Jesus' essential Jewishness. And it still makes many of our, takes many of our students by surprise. On the other hand, many of our peers, even in religious studies, think in terms of a wholly anachronistic concept of freestanding religions in historical context where such a concept had no actuality. And when it comes to the history of Christianity, it's essential that we understand that this religious movement, by taking advantage of the cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism of the newly created Roman Empire, created an innovation and an anomaly a trans-ethnic identity that defied existing categories. People didn't know how to talk about it. Was it some sort of syndicate or a cultic association? Was it a new nation, a new ethnos, made up of formerly distinct ethnicities, just as the Roman ethnos had been created? But if so, where was this geographic center? It took time for this category problem to be resolved by the creation of a totally new category, religion is an identity independent of locale and ethnicity. So to understand the historical Jesus, we must cross this historical barrier to an age where Jesus could only have been talking about the meaning of Jewishness, the values and goals of Jewishness. Of course, we must be careful not to repeat our anachronistic approach, and by, in a sense, saving the historical Jesus from his Christian identity, assume that the Jewishness he was involved in uh, looked like the rabbinic Judaism that later prevailed. Starting with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls more than 65 years ago, another secret has been getting out, that Judaism, before the destruction of the Temple in the year 70, was very different from later rabbinic Judaism. 
and it has become increasingly clear in recent decades that rabbinic Judaism did not suddenly take over and define Jewishness after the temple was destroyed, but took centuries to prevail over a great variety of alternative Judaisms, several of which may have been closer to the Jewishness known to Jesus. And that brings us to Paul, or rather, the new Paul. The secret one that has been revealed in recent decades of research. Surely, the popular view goes, if Jesus saw himself as Jewish rather than as the founder of a new religion, then Paul must have been the true founder of Christianity. Well, not so fast. The new Paul, still hotly debated by upholders of the traditional view, was no more creating a new religion than Jesus was. According to this new understanding, Paul saw himself simply as introducing a new eschatological messianic approach to Judaismos, a way for non-Jews to gain entry to the promises God made to the Jewish people by a way other than through observance of Torah law. Not to replace the Jews as recipients of God's promises, but to themselves become Jews by a special way. And as so many things in religious studies, we have a German term for that. The Sonderweg special way, and fill up the number of the saved in place of the missing lost tribes of Israel. No new texts or discoveries were needed to discover this new Paul. Just a fresh reading of Paul's letters without the assumptions of later Christian doctrine. Now, I, while I had absolutely no involvement in this development of the new Paul, um, the kind of fresh reading of what Paul could have meant in his own time by what he wrote was something I attempted uh, with the article, which, interestingly enough, is the most cited article that I've written, even though it's not about Manichaeans. Uh, because of the Angels, published in the Journal of Biblical Literature very early in my career, in it I analyze a passage in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and demonstrate that Paul belonged to a world of thought that didn't look very much like either later Christian or Jewish orthodoxies, but came closer to apocalyptic and Gnostic traditions. Through the fading of the latter movements, later readers of Paul lost the context in which to understand what he is talking about when he says that we are in a situation of having differentiated genders because of the angels. For the Jews of Paul's time and the Christians who were among these Jews, angels carried out acts of creation on behalf of God, and imperfectly so. In other words, they took the blame for the world's imperfections among which Paul counted the temporary physical distinctions of gender. In order to properly understand what Paul writes, we must, we must push back through later readings to the thought world of his own time. And it turns out to explain a great deal about the existence within early Christianity of groups such as Marcionites and Gnostics and Manichaeans, who saw various lesser or even malign superhuman beings coming between humanity and the ultimate God. Now, it sounds very strange to modern Christians that some early Christians thought that the God Jesus spoke of was not the Creator God. It has been traditional to think of Marcionite and Gnostic Christians who held this position as some sort of deviation from an original view that was carried forward into the Orthodox creeds. Yet Jewish apocalypticism expressed in such texts as the Dead Sea Scrolls shows quite a bit of qualification and complication of simple monotheism. Just who is Paul talking about when he speaks of a God of this world, opposed to the God of Jesus? And what is his point in attributing the creation of gender human bodies to angels rather than to God? And what is his judgment on the traditional touchstones of Jewish religious practice when he attributes the Torah not to God but to angels and says that one of the faults of Jewish practice is worship of angels? In other words, how far had Paul's apocalyptic worldview taken him in setting the stage for forms of Christianity that saw this world under the dominion of lesser gods. Marcionites, Gnostics, and Manichaeans all represent outgrowths of this more cosmically critical kind of Christianity. And from their vantage point, it is easy to detect this theme in the New Testament writings. But to the modern Christian reader, the overpowering assumption of monotheism squeezes out the complexity of the heavens known to the early Christians. Yet it was precisely this idea that Jesus reveals a new, higher God that proudly induced Marcion to collect key Christian writings into the first New Testament, the subject of my recent book of that. 
I wrote it not to argue the secret for the first time, because it's, it's well known that Marcion put together the first New Testament, but to remind my colleagues in the field something that they've been aware of, but have consistently ignored or set aside with various excuses about why this doesn't count and why this isn't really the first New Testament, because after all, a heretic came up with the idea, and therefore it can't correspond to what becomes the New Testament. But such a thing as the New Testament was needed because Marcion believed that the Jewish scriptures referred to a different God. That gives us an ideological context within which to understand the drive to canonize and sacralize Christian texts into a new Bible. But I have argued that the consequence is more important than Marcion's motive. And that consequence is Marcion's move to text and to canon against the background of a predominantly oral religious movement. Our own conditioning to the idea of scripture keeps us from seeing the novelty of text in an ancient world where religion was primarily non-textual. Textual canons were typical in the context of philosophical schools, not religious practice. And Christianity undoubtedly underwent a period in the second century when, for lack of a, a better conceptual category, it could most easily be understood within the category of a new philosophy. One of the biggest secrets yet to sink in with most of those working on the subject of really Christianity is the anachronism of New Testament as a distinct period in that history. This is, there's a structural inertia here uh, because of the background out of which biblical studies comes into religious studies. Um, the confusion of a theological canonical category of text with a period of Christian history. But Marcion's attempt to close a canon 100 years after Jesus was rejected by most Christians, who took more than 200 more years to follow his lead, and even then only in isolated local pronouncements. A biblical canon was not a priority or even a subject of the major councils of the 4th century. While it's true that the texts eventually included come from an early period of Christian history, they can no longer be considered as the only Christian literature of that period, or understood in isolation only in dialogue with one another the way they still are typically handled in biblical studies. We can only fathom the significance of what they say and how they say it in comparison and contrast to the contemporaneous voices of the wide diversity of early Christianities and Judaisms. But wait a minute, you're probably thinking, how did we get from a very Jewish Jesus and Paul to a complete rejection of Jewish connections in the Christian Marcy? Once we escape the anachronism of dating the separation of the Christian movement from its Jewish origins in the time of Jesus and Paul, the answer to when and why and how the separation occurred is one of those things that has been hiding in plain sight. Between 66 and 137 CE, the Jewish population of Judea was twice decimated by major wars. And in between, in the years 115 to 117, the Jews of the Diaspora went through an equally genocidal conflict across Syria, Egypt, and Libya. The Jewish population of Egypt, for example, was all but wiped out. And with it died not only the Hellenized Judaism of a figure such as Philo, but also whatever form the Jewish Christian movement took in that time. If you've ever looked at one of those maps that shows the spread of early Christianity, notice it all goes north, along the northern edge of the Mediterranean. What about the south, where in fact the largest Jewish population stood as a fertile ground for the movement? All traces of it were lost, and Christianity had to be reintroduced into Egypt by non-Jews several generations later. So we're missing a big chunk of the picture of the earliest Christian movement because of the devastation that the Jewish community faced in this roughly century of trauma. So these traumatic upheavals of the Jewish people, followed by reprisals and indemnities and loss of civil rights and popular resentment, provide the most likely context for the breakaway of those Christians of Paul's special way, non-observant of Torah law, observance of which was periodically prohibited by the Roman state, and now motivated to disassociate from their Torah observant brethren. Marcin appears exactly at this time, in the wake of the Bar Kokhba War, as an organizer of non-Jewish Christian communities and ideologue of the break of Judaism. But what about those other Christians who did not follow Marcion? Those proto-Orthodox Christians, as we like to say to avoid issues. 
who continue to value the Jewish scriptures and accept the God of those scriptures as the God of Jesus. Once again, our own overexposure to this ultimately victorious form of Christianity obscures from our view what would be and was striking about them in their original historical context. It was actually commented upon by their critics outside and within the larger Christian movement. What I mean is their wholesale appropriation of another people's religion as their own. In other words, the most striking thing about them was that they were mostly non-Jews who, with the devastation of Jewish communities in the period for the reasons I just explained, selectively claimed Jewish texts and culture and identified themselves as the new, improved, true Israel. I've tried to sharpen the focus on this development in recent articles and talks by comparing it provocatively to white American appropriation of Native American religion and culture, of which there are a variety of groups dating back to the 19th century and continuing today. In recent public discourse, the Christian-Jewish conflict has often been treated as an unfortunate and wholly unnecessary aberration of Christian identity. But in fact, the conflict over the rival claims to be the true Israel stands at the very core of Christian identity and must be confronted head on. To completely dismiss any such conflict over identity requires choosing Marcion's or Mani's view of Christianity rather than the Orthodox. Now from this point on, from the second, middle of the second century CE, the familiar history of Christianity tends to focus on a series of doctrinal controversies. A symptom, I think, of an academic perspective where texts and ideas are our whole life and it's easy to think of people we study as like ourselves in that respect. But given the mass illiteracy of early Christians and, of course, the whole ancient world, um, this intellectual focus is almost certainly missing the main driving forces of early Christian history. Such things as ritual and other practices, community demographics and politics, ethnic and linguistic and cultural barriers, and the consequent translations of the Christian movement into distinct local contexts and expectations. So I'll start to juxtapose here text and practice. What bring, this brings us to Manichaeism, the subject to which I have devoted the bulk of my work, and as mentioned, the topic of my dissertation. A perennial question asked about Manichaeism is whether this religious movement, originating beyond the Eastern Roman frontier in the third century, should be understood as a Christian heresy or as an independent religion in its own right. And like so many other dichotomous questions in religious studies, the answer is yes and yes. It has become increasingly clear from work I've been involved in on such texts as the polemical Acts of Archelaus and the newly deciphered Manichaean Chester B. Kepalaya Codex that Manichaeism should be understood as the first wave of the Christian movement further into Asia from its place of origin. And acculturated in Mesopotamia and Iran rather than in, in um, the Greco-Roman cultural context. The Kepalai, which recounts the missionary activities of the founder, Mani, throughout Mesopotamia, Iran, and what is today Pakistan, shows him putting the words of Jesus into comparison and dialogue with the teachings of Zoroaster, the Buddha, and other messengers of God within his Asian environment. And this map just shows a late, much later picture of Mani here. And these are the names that appear in the Chester B. Kepalaya of some of these other religious figures uh, whose followers he's entered into dialogue with. So the text itself is in Coptic, so you see that some of these names look a little bit different than the form you're used to. So in both this context and the parallel one in the Greco-Roman West, Christianity took up and repurposed regional culture, including religious culture. But ideologically and rhetorically, Western Christians, for the most part, rejected any continuity with prior religious culture. Whereas Mani took a different tack, affirming previous religious figures and teachings, and promoting Jesus as the culmination of those antecedents. Both had the same supersessionist intent, let's be clear about that, but framed it in opposite rhetorical strategies which, with dramatically different results and their ideologies. For Mani and the Manichaeans, then, the opposition of God and devil found in the Christian worldview could be equated with Zoroastrian dualistic ideas of eternal good and evil. 
The Christian Eucharist could be compared to Zoroastrian ritual practices of gathering the divine elements into a ritual process that reconnected them to their divine source. Christian asceticism could be seen as analogous to Buddhist and Jain disciplines of celibacy and self-restraint, and so on. It is in this process of cross-identification of religious elements that Mani developed what I have argued is the first theory of religions disembedded from their original cultural context. That is, a multiplicity of identities formed around authoritative teachers of the past, where adherence to their teachings, rather than location or ethnic identity, is paramount. In the Kapalaya, Mani picks out a set of elements constitutive of what he calls distinct churches, the, the term that's used in this particular text is ecclesia, but in other texts he uses other terms. And these are the things that he consistently identifies. He'll look at the Zoroastrian community, he'll look at the Buddhist community, and so forth, and he'll talk about these elements within these communities around him in the larger Sassanid Iranian world. So he believes they all are a product of revelation. They're all authorized by a particular historical founder. They organize a community. It's not just a teacher talking and people picking things up as they go. The founders actually organize a structure within which these teachings will be transmitted. He points out that prior to him, these teachings were generally localized in one region or another, or one language or another, and he's hoping to overcome that limitation and spread his teachings across the world. He talks about a succession of leadership that each of these traditions has a model of how authority is passed on through the generations, and they all have textual sources in various degrees of corruption from the original teachings, which of course he has come now to correct and perfect. And in a couple cases about the Indian religions, he also talks about them and having distinctive monuments that uh, identify them. Now, in the past, studies on Manichaeism have focused almost entirely on Manichaean doctrine. So there we go again. Especially its dualism and complex mythology of dualistic conflict. And it's fascinating stuff. This is a recently discovered Manichaean painting made in China uh, in late medieval times. It's preserved in a collection in Japan. My wife, Shijana Gulachi, is an expert on Manichaean art, and she's done an extensive study of this and the other recently discovered paintings. And this is a, a depiction of the Manichaean cosmos, as they understood it, starting from the hells below, rising up to the surface of the earth, and then up through the layers of the heavens, to a divine world above. And obviously we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at this closely, but you get a sense of the complexity of Manichaean cosmology, and it's fascinating, and that's why it's attracted a lot of attention. But this tendency also derives directly from the main focus of Christian polemics against Manichaeism, which faulted it primarily for its failure to acknowledge God's omnipotent supremacy, or even to attribute the creation of physical human beings to God. Lumping Manichaeism together with Christian Gnosticism, modern scholarship has in large part simply continued polemical characters of both movements' Baroque mythology and hostility to creation. These habits of academic discourse fail to acknowledge the ambivalence inherent in Christianity as a whole about the world and human nature, which Manichaeism and Gnosticism merely expressed in ways distinct from triumphant orthodoxy and from each other. And they also fail to recognize that in practice, even Orthodox Christianity has historically been full of armies of angels, devils, and saints, forming a crowded mythic cosmos, every bit as complex as anything found among Manichaeans or Gnostics. I've sort of creatively juxtaposed two different paintings, one of celestial realms above and one of hellish worlds below, from uh, various medieval Christian paintings to show, yeah, that looks pretty much like the Manichaean thing. <laughs> But why should the historical academic study of religion find itself, like its theological scholastic forebears, obsessing over how many angels can dance on the head of a pen? Why have we allowed ourselves to be mesmerized by the arcane discourses of literate elites of the past, who could tell us much about what they wanted and intended their religion to be, but precious little about what it actually was, as a living, breathing way of life among the vast majority of its adherents. There have always been those among us who specialize in religious practices and community life, but we've always been a minority in the field. 
laboring under the shadow of a dominant focus within religious studies on discourse and doctrine. There has even been a concerted effort among theorists in the field to render ritual into discourse, to find ritual's main significance in its role as a symbolic system, conveying and reinforcing doctrine by nonverbal means, or serving as a vehicle for expression rather than action. While ritual may function in these ways, any individual interpretation along these lines should be required to overcome an initial suspicion that it carries forward the academic bias in favor of discourse. At the very least, we should rigorously resist the assumption that discourse leads and ritual follows, rather than the reverse. Especially since historically we can observe a conservation of practices across major revolutions in discourse, and even surviving the replacement of one religion by another. Contemporaneous religions often share common practices, which spread from religion to religion as part of a deeply competitive religious marketplace in which they compete for adherence and have to keep up with rivals in what they have on offer to benefit would-be converts. I produced a short study of the transmission of confession and absolution practices, tracing them from an origin, from an origin in the ancient Near East as they were disseminated primarily by Manichaeans both east into South and Central Asia and west of the Roman Empire. By slight differences in, in what and how one confesses, and what else is required ritually to remedy one's transgressions, we can actually pin down a great deal of the moral ethos of a religion. And so differences in how Manichaeans confess and how they're absolved, or how Buddhists confess and are absolved, or how Catholic Christians confess and are absolved, if you look at the details, you can actually make out a lot of, you can, you can get a sort of key understanding of how these religions differ from each other in, in very large and profound ways. And then, of course, uh, there's my dissertation, which became my first book, as Professor Haberman said. And this is an attempt to look at a religion while prioritizing ritual and other practices. The Manichaean body gave ritual and other formal practices priority as elements structuring Manichaeism as a lived religion. It discussed only those doctrines that the practices themselves invoked through scripted ritual statements or chants or instructions or things like that. And I was able to show how one-sided approaches to the Manichaean system that ignored ritual could not answer even very basic questions about what the Manichaeans were doing or how they imagined achieving the goals of their religion. I was able to show a religion, Manichaeism, that far from despising the body and the world as expected from its dualistic doctrines, undertook to spiritually transform the body and to treat the world as a repository of divinity to be handled with the utmost reserve and reverence. In short, I turned previous views of Manichaeism on their head. And I think I could do this because ritual, by the simple fact that it is not discourse, is more resistant to all the ways we pour our own assumptions and imagination into interpreting the discourse of others. So when it comes to the study of Christian history more broadly, I think it is essential to start over with ritual and other practices and see just how much they invoke and make use of those doctrines that we have taken as essential to Christian identity and through which anachronistic readings flow back from the present to the past. What if Christian theology and Christology were responses to developments of liturgical practice? What if doctrine developed to justify and rationalize established patterns of conduct, or organization, or ritual performance? If these possibilities sound really strange to you, it just goes to show how much we come to historical questions with an ingrained sense of where we should look and what we should find, and we must struggle against these habits of inquiry. Yet as much as I and others would like to examine early Christianity through its practices, we are often forced to get to it through discourse, through text. We have precious little Manichaean archaeology and art, and none at all for Christianity in the first two centuries. Ritual scripts and service books help me to reconstruct Manichaean ritual, and it's crucial that these books actually show signs of actual use. They're actually worn. They'd actually been handled. They weren't just someone's imagined ideal of what should be used. But I must, must admit that, to a certain degree, I could only get to Manichaean practice as it was, to some degree, supposed to be authorized and sanctioned by the leaders, as it was planned and scripted, 
by uh, and promoted by the religious authorities. Since the religion persisted for some 1400 years, perhaps we are safe to assume that it worked, that it really produced successful embodiments of Manichaeanness. Yet I know from many examples, both in history and in the contemporary world, that religions do not always achieve their intended results. The people can intone religious slogans, but fail to internalize the values and conduct those slogans are meant to promote. So it was that I turned to the case of the most famous failed Manichaean, Augustine of Hippo. In his case, at least, we seem to have enough data to analyze what worked and didn't work in his decade as a Manichaean, where he resisted or misunderstood Manichaeism, and on what basis. And Augustine also serves as the logical end of this survey of early Christianity, representing as he does a bottleneck between the wide diversity of early Christianities and the Catholic monoculture that would assert itself in early medieval Western Europe. Augustine encapsulates the conflict between the two differently acculturated and systemized Christianities I've been mostly talking about, Manichaeism, Catholicism. Mesopotamian, Iranian form of Christianity, and the uh, Greco-Roman form of Christianity. When he finally chose Catholicism, he was able to defend it as the natural continuity of what was best in Greco-Roman civilization. He later qualified this, but to begin with, he, he saw it as a kind of logical continuity of that. While he painted Manichaeism as a really exotic import from Persia. But his desire to win his former Manichaean colleagues over to his new faith had very interesting consequences for the development of his own uptake of what was accepted among his peers in the Catholic Church as Orthodox. We are very lucky that he started writing at the time of his initial conversion and kept writing year by year as he gradually learned what Catholics stood for and emphasized in the Christian tradition. We are able to follow along and see how his understanding developed and changed through the years, and that's a very rare thing to have. And in the first decade and a half following his conversion, not only his own Manichaean past, but also his continuing engagement with Manichaean contemporaries had a profound impact on which parts of Catholic heritage he paid most attention to and how he understood them. The result was that in his own lifetime, Augustine was neither a Catholic nor a Manichaean, as those two identities were defined at the time. Representatives of both communities roundly condemned him for getting their respective religions wrong. He was, rather, an individual in whom these two traditions intersected, and one might better say collided. Arguably, Augustine's most profound impact on later Christianity, both Catholic and Protestant, involves his ideas on the role of God's grace in initiating the salvation of human beings, who are so mired in sin that they cannot exercise their own free will to resist it. And this is what I've been able to show. You can look through the entire corpus of Orthodox writers in the first four centuries of Christian history and not find this Augustinian notion of grace in any of them. It is entirely his innovation in the tradition, as other Catholic leaders complained at the time. And they also were quite clear where they thought Augustine had gotten this heretical denial of human free will, the Manichaeans, who emphasized God's grace, and who read Paul in accord with his emphasis. So they were absolutely right. And this reading of Paul became standard in Catholic and Protestant Christianity until today through Augustine's introduction of this Manichaean interpretation of the Apostle. Once again, the typical way Christian history has been done is, is to deny that this is possible, that something originally heretical made a lasting contribution to the Christian orthodoxy we know today. It's the same whether we're talking about the idea of the New Testament, liturgical or other ritual practices, or core doctrines such as grace. The desire is to work back along a perfectly orthodox pedigree, no matter how faint and remote the affiliation. So in the case of the idea of grace, the anachronistic historiography would be that Paul clearly had this idea, and that it was just sitting there, obviously, on the page of his writings. So it was inevitable for a smart, receptive man like Augustine to see it there. Just as he was sitting alone with the text, no influence from his time, his environment, his place, his conversation partners. It's just him and Paul, alone in a room. 
And this wildly implausible way of describing the historical process has prevailed and does prevail in the historical study of Christianity today. But I actually relish challenges such as this, and I, I watch a lot of true crime shows that detail how a case is assembled, and no doubt that has shaped how I go about doing my work. So in the second volume of Augustine's Manichaean Dilemma, I demonstrated the free will Augustine who existed before, and all the free will conversation partners he had in the Catholic community, and then the grace Augustine who followed, and the bitter complaints against him from that same community, and in between I could place him in a precise two-day period at the end of August 392, in a room with a Manichaean who insistently argued for a grace reading of Paul against Augustine's own attempts to defend a free will Paul. And you know, in the, in the work of history, you just don't get evidence that lines up that good that often. Now let me be clear that in joining in this work to uncover the secret history of Christianity, I have not been guided by Protestant presuppositions that dominate much of research into Christian origins, by which whatever was original and earliest is best. By better understanding early Christian history, I'm not identifying a more authentic Christianity or supplying resources for a new Christian normativity. Modern Christians cannot be what early Christians were, because the whole matrix of our culture, our concept of selfhood, our understanding of the universe we inhabit, renders early Christianity obsolete. That is, of little use to modern Christians. Religions must adapt to such contextual changes or die. As Manichaeans and dozens of other alternative forms of Christianity died. That does not mean that what passes as mainstream or orthodox Christianity today is the best adapted form for our own time. It only means that it was the form best adapted or positioned as some crucial bottleneck of historical development of the past, which other forms did not successfully pass through. History has not ended, and the outcomes of past history, even while they do constrain the options available to the awareness of modern people, do not guarantee the same outcome for subsequent crises of meaning and purpose. But how can I dare in this postmodern age, to claim that what I have outlined here today is an objectively truer, more accurate account of early Christian history. Does not every age, every generation remake the past by its own concerns and predilections? Indeed it does. And this recurring colonization of the past by the present must be continuously resisted by the hard work of historians, not only on their sources, but on themselves. It has become surprisingly common to me among academics to celebrate the processes postmodernism exposes. When postmodernism began, and we can perhaps say it was Nietzsche, as a critique of the triumphalist historical myth modernity had created on the bones of the past. The historian can only serve the present by recovering something in Nietzsche's words untimely something counter to it. We can't do that by inventing a past that's timely. We can only do it by confronting the present with the otherness of the past, by a past that resists the present, and by which all of the smug certainties of the present may be called into question and reevaluated. Um, but so, for example, the free will debates uh, of you know of, 
Uh, it seems to me those are a really fascinating kind of thing to juxtapose in the St. Augustine, the way you so beautifully put it, Augustine, the sort of, you know, the looking at the free will Paul versus the grace Paul, right. comparing it to the kind of way, say, neuroscientists do free will debates today. I mean, I wonder, if you, you know, that makes it not obsolete, it seems to me. I wonder how you think about that. That's a very interesting way to pose the question. Um, but by using the example of modern neuroscience, there again, what I would say is, well, okay, so Paul didn't know modern neuroscience, and Augustine didn't know modern neuroscience. So although we can detect points of comparison between how they conceptualize things, their premises were completely different. And so I think we need to be careful um, not to think that we can wholly embrace these things from the past, even though they might provoke us to think about the modern world differently, we can't assume that there's, there's going to be a harmonious marriage and that Paul is fresh again because of modern neuroscience. Well, we, but we might unsettle the smug certainties of the neuroscientists that they have discovered ways of thinking about free will that no one ever thought of before, or, or challenging rather, free will. I example. absolutely agree with that. Right. That one of the things that I find most important in my work on the Manichaeans is, is the way in which they have wrestled with a lot of these same issues. Exactly the ones you bring up about how we're discovering that, um, that modern neuroscience is discovering that often we're not initiating our actions, but we're catching ourselves in the act and doing something about it. And the Manichaeans exactly analyze human behavior in these terms. And of course, they attribute it to a force of evil within us, which is starting the action, and then the force of good intervenes and tries to intercede and, and redirect that action. So again, the, the, the frame of the universe in which they're working is completely alien to ours. But they were observing something that I would say is real. That they, with their own limited, uh, you know, non-scientific methods of observation of self, they could observe the same thing that neuroscientists were seeing, but then translate it within their respective contexts of reality. So I do think that there's a very fruitful engagement with the past that comes out of these kinds of comparisons. As long as we're really careful. Thank you. Yeah. I, I was, uh, Brian, can you stand up so we can? <laughs> so uh, you talk about the relationship between ritual and um, doctrine and practice. Right. And you seem to be suggesting that, well, the default as scholars, because of work on this, because all we have is text, is that we think that doctrine shapes ritual. And you were suggesting the other way, that ritual shapes doctrine more. So do you think that we should think about this question in a broad sense, or should we look at like, can, can we generalize in the study of religion, or should we think about it in different historical situations in which ritual or doctrine might, you know, I know they interact with each other, but which we should sort of privilege? Yeah, it's a great question. I think we should always compare and never generalize. So I think that we have to stick very close to the specific cases and see what's going on and never assume anything in religious studies. That you're, you're not going to have a grand theory that explains Religion is X, or in all in religions, ritual always needs over doctrine, or vice versa. There's, there's going to always be the, in the strange category we all work in, religion. Um, there's all kinds of things married together in that in that category of reality, and so it is important to see how any any individual case I think compares to other individual cases. It's important to distinguish cases that were in historical contact from cases that are absolutely not in historical contact. And that's going to be a different level of analysis of what might be common to the way humans approach certain kinds of things in their reality. But in, in terms of the specifics of ritual versus doctrine, I'm going to keep pushing the priority of ritual until the balances have reached their point. Obviously, I don't think that, that ritual always leads and doctrine always follows, but I think it's been so tilted the other way that we need to constantly be suspicious and question the tendency to prioritize doctrine. And even though questions might sound really bizarre to us at first, that, that ritual could actually be dictating theology, we need to really test it first and not uh, assume that it can't be the case. I'm going to go back to Jim in the back there. Jason, that was a terrific talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, two follow questions. One is, uh, I read Augustine not only as 
very, very indebted to Paul and John, but close to an analysis of my self-experience, which is obviously informed by Augustine, John, and Paul. So I don't, I don't know whether his Manichaeanism in that case, uh, you know, had to prevail in working out the doctrine of grace that I find very closely uh, uh, articulated in uh, by Augustine of John and Paul. Just a word about neuroscience. Augustine uh, had a keen sense of first-person experience, and we know that Cartesian cogito is already there full blown. And so he had a first a sense of first person experience in its in its in its uh, um, kind of epidicticity, indubitability and so forth. And he, and he and he ran with that very well. And he read Plato. And Plato has a very good response to brain science and and uh, uh, and the uh, um, dominance of efficient causality in accounting for our mental events. So it, it, again, I think there is a kind of possibility of philosophy. In other words, that we don't have to so deconstruct every statement and put us all in a, a, a box, a dark box, and wondering what, how they could possibly say what they're saying because I don't belong to their century. Thank you. Yes, um, I, I do strongly agree that every individual brings to their encounter with any with a religion or a cultural tradition. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks. I, I do agree that every individual brings to their encounter with a religion or a culture or an upbringing or whatever uh, an irreducible individuality that they then sort of negotiate their uptake of the tradition in light of their own background, their own introspection, and so forth. I, I would, however, say that I think in looking at someone like Augustine, his introspection is a very um, trained, adapted, learned thing. That he's gone through several layers of different kinds of education that has taught him to be introspective in particular ways. And that we couldn't have just a, a Augustine walking out of the woods raised by wolves and seeing what he sees. And so he has his classical education. And then he has his decade as a Manichaean. And, and I have looked at ways in which some of the things he says later in recollecting his own past, I think have clearly been shaped by the Manichaeans telling him, look at it this way. Why did you steal those damn pears? What was wrong with you? And by, by getting him to look at something which was just a, an innocuous teenage prank, and take it so seriously that he goes on for a whole book of confessions about it, I think that's the Manichaeans working on it. It's not, I don't believe we have an Augustine who's a middle-aged man still wringing his hands over stealing pears when he's a teenager. I think we have a middle-aged man who's been conditioned by relentless analysis that the Manichaean elect are saying, now tell us again, why did you steal those pairs? And working it over and over and over until it's an obsession, because it, for them it proved that there's a force of evil inside of him. Just, he can't explain it. He, he can't find a single motive for it. Obviously, it must be inarticulate, pure evil. And of course, he has to overwrite that and correct that with a Catholic introspection that he's since learned, but the layers sort of bleed through. It's like a palimpsest. And so you can see the Manichaean layer of interpretation, the Catholic layer of interpretation. So I, I would agree with you that the individual, what the individual brings, goes through these conditionings that direct introspection in particular ways, and, and out of this combination, we get what we think of as the individual. So I appreciate the comments on that. Yes. I'm interested in the way you're kind of giving us this vision of context. And it's, it, it seemed like a almost perfectly tightly woven together thing that was all over the place, but no single strand could ever be sort of similarly removed at any one time. 
or else you have something totally different. Sure. Okay. Then I'm wondering though, so a couple things. One is your use of the word anachronism. Mm -hmm. Isn't our concept of context somewhat anachronistic? So therefore, maybe that in itself that there's some useful anachronism and not useful anachronism. That's another kind of thing I was thinking about and not still listening to you. Another is, do we, is it context always singular or are there multiple overlapping contexts, some of which can live past other contexts? So that we have to think about how do we decide when something is past contextually? Yes, I would completely agree with your latter statement that there's multiple overlapping contexts that have different origin points, different finishing points, and it's a very complicated thing. And I think that basically answers your first point, which is that there's all kinds of useful heuristic things we have to do. Otherwise, we just have too much, too much to look at, and there's, there's, a, there's a totality that we can't sort out unless we impose limits and barriers and boundaries and categories that we can use. So we're always going to be being anachronistic in certain ways. But we have to be self-conscious about it and guarded about it and realize we're imposing it to get from point A to point B in our analysis. And then we have to turn around and say, okay, now that we've figured this little thing out, we have to sort of deconstruct our anachronism and, and to move on to the, from point B to point C and not let these, these categories that we bring to what we study control the data that we're looking at, but simply frame it for us in one step from another. And so, Yes, we, we're always going to be anachronistic, but there is a kind of overwhelming anachronism, a teleology, that enters into many of our fields of study. And I think it's particularly true of history of Christianity, because of the culture that many of us are from and, and, and the way our whole society and, and worldview has been shaped by that culture. The way Christian history is, is highly normatively structured. and. Uh, you might think in this day and age, 21st century, we've overcome that, but I'm here to tell you it's not my impression that we have. Well, I think that might be a, a good place to start, uh, stop, uh, start our party. Uh, so thank you, Jason, very much. Please join us for the reception in the adjoining room here. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>